In Crusader Kings 3, one of the best ways to expand your realm is through outright war. In this video today, we're going to be covering the many ways that you can actually go to war using all the claims, such as the different types of claims, as well as how to cover combat, how it works, as well as sieges. Now, it can seem very convoluted on the surface level, but once you kind of dive through a lot of the tool tips, you'll hopefully get a better understanding as I walk you through some of the combat scenarios in Crusader Kings 3. So again, my typical fashion to just time to present the information up front. Uh, if you take a look at the timeline, you'll be able to see the chapters that correspond to the subjects that I cover in this video to see if this video is for you. If not, go ahead and shut it down. Not a big deal. But hopefully this will give you some better information on how to prosecute a war in Crusader Kings 3. As always though, if you would like to pick the game up and you haven't just yet, or you have a friend that wants to purchase it, you can use my purchase link in the description below to uh, get a small discount on the game as well as receiving a uh, commission on my end. As of the creation of this video, there was still a discount, but that might be ending very soon. I'm not too sure. But let's dive on into the game and have some fun with war, combat, and claims in Crusader Kings 3. So before we actually get into war and combat, we have to talk about claims and Cassius Bellies and, and appointing these claims and how they all work. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take a look at Sicily once again with uh, Robert Giscar and uh, his lovely kingdom of, well, Sicily. And the way that this works is that you have de jure claim to any title or, or piece of land that falls under your respective title. For, for instance here, we can see the blue outline that shows me Sicily, or at least what I own of Sicily. If I press this button, the kingdom tiles, I, watch right here. It's part of the kingdom of Sicily, but I do not own it. This is just part of what the title includes for the kingdom of Sicily. It includes all of this respective land. So because I do not own it, but I am the king of Sicily, I have a de jure claim to these lands. They are held by three different factions. And as a result, I currently have a Cassius Belli, or the ability to declare war on all three of these locations. Now, I'm going to show you those real quick. I can't declare war on Naples because my character currently is out of truce, but we'll go over that in a little bit later here and how truces work. But if I click over here to the Issues tab, and I take a look at Declare Wars, I can see that these two right here show me that I can declare war on Pope Alexander for the de jure claim to the County of Benevento, which is just a Ponzi name, right here. Obviously, we can't do this right now because of my current situation, but this shows me that because I have the title of King of Sicily, I have this de jure uh, county at my uh, beck and call for my Cassius Belly. Now, if I look at here at Duke Richard of Capua, it's the same situation. Seize the county of Capua because I am again the king of Sicily. If you haven't gotten it by now, I'm the king of Sicily. It's awesome. But let's take, for example, Salerno here. Salerno and Camarda are part of the Duchy of Salerno. And even though I do own Camarda, let's assume that I didn't. And I was not a king. I was just simply some dude and I created the title for Duchy of Salerno. This would then give me a de jure claim to any land that is not within my realm that is part of this title. You can see right here, inside your realm, Duchy of Camarda, County of Salerno. If I click over here to the Kingdom of Sicily, I can see inside your realm, if I scroll up a little bit, the Duchy of Apulia, the Duchy of Calabria, but, inside Pope Alexander's realm, the Duchy of Benevento, and inside uh, Duke Richard of Capua's realm, the Duchy of Capua. Now, I have not created these duchies yet, so um, that is neither here nor there because I have the higher claim in the kingdom. So I know it can get a little confusing here. Sometimes it's kind of easier to take a look at an individual county, and you can see the de jure hierarchy right here. And this shows you that the county of Capua is de jure part of the Duchy of Capua, which is de jure part of the Kingdom of Sicily, which is then de jure part of, let me scroll out, the Byzantine Empire. So, the best way to kind of look at de jure titles and claims 
on just simply a land basis is that anything above the respective level, so anything above a, a barony, so a duchy, a duchy, a, a kingdom above a, a duchy, and then an empire above a kingdom, those get the claims below them. So just to really quickly exemplify that real fast, here's all of our counties. So everything right here falls within the duchy of Apulia right there. And so being the Duke of Apulia gives you claims to all three of these counties. Now, just like we've seen before, being the King of Sicily gives me the de jure claim to everything in this little um, highlighted area. And then being the Emperor of the Byzantine Empire gives me the de jure claim to all of this land. So you can press this claim depending upon whatever level you want to do. The Byzantine Empire could declare war on me on my entire kingdom trying to claim the King of Sicily. Or it could say, uh, you know, we're only going to press that claim onto the Dukedom of Apulia. So they've got that that right here because of the the oopsie, sorry, because of the de jure hierarchy that all falls under the Byzantine Empire. So they can pretty much declare war on whatever they want. So that's how land claims work as relegated to titles. But there's also three other claims: implicit pressed and unpressed they kind of follow that general hierarchy so let's take a look at my character and let's look at my son my prince my primary heir as it were so he's going to inherit all of the claims that my current character my his parent his father has you can see the little shield here it shows an implicit claim and when we take a look at that and implicit claims are claims that are given to eligible children on all titles held by their parents. If a parent loses a title, the child's implicit claim will be removed as well, or two. Now, it does say parents, so it's not just simply your liege, it's both your um, mother and father. So if he were to have any claims as a result of my wife, his mother, then he would get those claims. Then implicit claims, once they become active, let's say that, for example, the liege dies and then my son takes over as king, all of these implicit claims become pressed claims. And then let's say that Prince Roger here, Prince Roger, he decided to have a bunch of kids because that's what you do. Um, when those kids come about, they will have unpressed claims if I decide to not push upon any of these claims. And I'll give you a visual representation of what those look like in just a second here. So basically think of it like this. Implicit claim is the best because it's inherited and it immediately turns to a pressed claim once it's fully inherited and your liege passes away. If you don't ever act upon that claim, like take for example, um, the County of Palermo here. Let's assume that I did not own the County of Palermo and I decided not to ever push on it with Prince Roger. Well, his son would still have an unpressed claim to that duchy. And if he, again, the great, great grandchild of me, Prince Robert, Robert didn't did not use that unpressed claim, then they would lose it. So basically, implicit to, to pressed to unpressed gives you those generational gaps between claiming a certain location or title. It allows you to not have to be forced into acting upon things immediately. But let me give you a visual representation of what a pressed and unpressed claim looks like. Uh, I'm going to go to court. I'll just click this dude. Cool. So he's got a pressed claim. Pressed claim are considered legally strong and are inherited as unpressed claims by the children of the claimant. Really, really important there. Like I said, implicit will turn to pressed pressed will turn to unpressed unpressed will turn to nothing so as we look at unpressed claim unpressed claims are legally tenuous and are not inherited by the children of the claimant however unpressed claims become pressed if they are used in a cassius belly to declare war even if the war ends in a white piece so what that means is just to recap here let's say that this character were to press upon the claim of the county of palermo I'm sorry, let's do an unpressed claim. So the county of Malta. So right there, they were to press upon this claim. And you know what? They just couldn't siege the the, the, uh, the county of Malta. They couldn't take it over. And they just vie for a white piece. Things go about as normal. Well, now that unpressed claim 
turns into a pressed claim, as it says here, right here in this um, uh, tooltip. So an unpressed claim can move to a pressed claim where it will then transition, stick with me, back to an unpressed claim with your children. So pressing a claim and declaring a war, even if you don't win, is not a terrible idea because it kind of keeps that claim active in your uh, your legacy, your 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 bloodline, whatever it is you want to call it, it'll keep it active for you, even if you don't actually claim and receive that title through war. So that is very important. But outside of these pressed, unpressed, and implicit claims, the real question can be how to get these claims outside of just simply titles. So we went over titles. We discussed, you know, oh, okay, the dukes, the kings, the emperors all have claim to everything below them. Well, you can also marry into a claim. So let me see if I, here, I'll, I'll arrange a marriage. Maybe find a spouse. I think this guy's already married, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't matter for this video. <laughs> and we're going to turn on a filter here. Um, claims, there it is. Let's just go, uh, we'll just do any claims just to, to see what we can find here. So if my character here, if my, my son, Prince Guy, were to marry uh, Adelheid, he will then gain the claims on the following titles, those three counties. So this can be a really powerful way to marry into very strong um, dynasties to expand your own. Of course, your character, depending on what situation it is, maybe you're marrying a daughter off and they're going off in that direction. Maybe you're matrilineally marrying a daughter, so they're come, those kids are coming into your house. Or maybe you're marrying a brother or a sister off. Those are great ways to expand your dynasty because your characters are out doing their thing in other portions of the world while you manage your primary realm, your top realm as it were. And you can, from there, press on these claims as you see fit depending upon the marriage scenario that you create for yourself. So again, just as an example here, you've got alliances and you've got this claim. Um, I'll just click, uh, who's got like a, who likes me? Who wants to who wants to jump in bed with Papa Gee? Um, opinion of me. There we go. So, as a solid claim, let's go ahead and click this. They will accept, and I will gain those claims. And it will be a great way to expand your claims and your empire by marrying into those claims. Now, we've already discussed the implicit claims that will transfer to your children but that is another great way to get claims because if you marry into a situation where you've got claims those claims will carry down as implicit claims so i said claims like 50 times already but those implicit claims are huge because it's pretty much con it's continuing that that uh, legacy of title acquisition through your children through your nieces and your nephews depending on what marriage situation you create for yourself now, there is another way to get a claim, and that is inviting claimants to your court. This right here. I unfortunately can't invite any more claimants because I've already invited a ton already. You can see here my guests. Um, you'll see the icons. If we scroll through the rest of my court, you'll pretty much just see who has the claims to what. It's denoted right here, of course. So we'll go all the way down. But these three up here at the top are claimants that I invited to my court not too long ago, and they give me tons of claims. Take, for example, this guy, who has a claim to my entire kingdom, more or less, uh, through the duchies and the counties associated in Sicily. Or take a look at this, this gentleman here, who has claims to the county of Salerno and the duchy of Salerno. Or this gentleman as well, who has a pressed claim to the Duchy of Salerno and the County of Salerno. Remember, pressed will transfer down to his children if he never presses upon them. So claims can be very convoluted and it can be very difficult to determine how to get them and how to deal with them. And hopefully this gives you a better idea of what claims actually mean. And the, the easiest way to get a claim is to um, create a title above the land you're seeking. For example, like I said before, creating the Duchy of Salerno would give me a claim to these locations. There's one other way you can get a claim, that's by going to your council and using this, fabricate claim on a county. Now, 
if this is for any head of religion, they'll be able to do this. But it's important to note, though, that the claim that they create is an unpressed claim, meaning it's only going to be valid for the guy he's creating it for, and that's it. It's not going to pass down to his kids unless you go to war and it becomes a pressed claim. So that covers how to get claims, what the three types of claims are, and how claims really work from a top-down level. Hopefully I didn't lose you there, but let's jump now over to once you've got those claims and committing to war and combat and how that really unveils on the map. So here we are at war now with Capua and Naples. And I'm gonna show you how terrain works, how armies work, and a lot of these buttons that you see scattered throughout the, uh, the entire little HUD here. So to start off, let's go ahead and summon some of our vassals, or I'm sorry, our allies to war with us. We can see that we've already got one guy joining us. Uh, but let's go ahead and press tab, and then go to call allies to war, and then you can just bring more people to bear. And I usually kind of like to do this, especially if I'm fighting a harder opponent. Not so much in this case, but I just wanted to kind of show how to do it. You spend some of your prestige, they come and join you. We'll do the same thing here for Count Vitale. Good, and unpause, and they'll just say, hey, yeah, I'll come join, super duper. Great, so that'll get us some additional troops coming to help us out. And there might be situations where that's pretty advantageous, and we're gonna go over that right now. So. We can take a look at the first army of Salerno. It's elite quality, it's got some good knights in there, we've got some men-at-arms that are skirmishers, and we've got the commander. Now the commander has a value, his commander advantage. And you can press, if I move this away, this button right here to swap out and get a new commander. So for example, I can put myself in here and I've got 37 commander advantage and that's really huge. And I'll show you why that is. So this is gonna help us out when we get to the actual combat. So we'll show that in a second here. But we've also got four buttons at the bottom here. This one will allow me to split this army off into a new army by just sending, uh, say, individual knights, uh, individual men-at-arms regiments, or individual levies from all the counties that make up my realm. I can split into two equal armies right here by pressing split in half. I can press this button to split off my hired soldiers and special soldiers. This way, if you maybe put a mercenary army and combine them into this force, you can just press that button and bring them right together. Um, then you get these two buttons at the top. Reorganize, which is reorganizes the, arm, the regiments of two armies, and merge armies. So if I were to press this button, I'll just press it real quick. You can see that there are now two armies right here. Well, I'm going to just drag that over like that and it should allow me to get both the armies, and I can just press Merge Armies, boom, and they're all put together under one commander yet again. Swap back to me. We also get the Elite Quality, all that kind of fun action, but there's two big things on this that the game doesn't really do an awesome job of explaining. Supplies and attrition. So your army will suffer attrition as it moves away from its controlled realm and they will be, they'll start to deplete their supplies. And their supplies deplete depending upon the supply limit of the county in which they're in. So let's take a look here at the barony of Elif. Left click it. Our supply limit is 3,555 in this specific county. Move over here, okay? It's 3,950 right here, 6,662. So <clears throat> it can maintain that level of troops within it. There are 1,985 troops out of the supply limit of 3,555. So let's take this army and attack the guy in the mountains here. As soon as we press right click, you can see that this is a potential battle. We've got more soldiers. We've got a better army commander, but they're defending in the mountains. That's not too awesome. Let's go back to this real quick. What can this guy do? Raid speed, hostile county attrition, and crosses water. Well, that's not going to be as advantageous here, so let's maybe go with this. Um, just stick with what I've got. We can also see that our ally is going to join us. Pretty much for the most part, your allies will just follow you into combat and do what you do. But let's go ahead and let this progress here. I'm going to slow this down to uh, just the single little blip of time. <clears throat> this will allow me to really go over a lot of stuff. So as soon as we make contact... We have a potential battle in two days. We're going to win decisively because we're now getting reinforced by these guys. Or, no, they're going to they're not going to do that, it looks like. So let me click this, and we're going to go over this situation. Well, there are four battle phases. 
the movement maneuver phase, the early battle phase, the late battle phase, and then the aftermath. And we'll progress through them as we go through this fight. But from this menu, we can see how many total soldiers are fighting, you know, 1985 versus 741, how many routed casualties there are. And there's two types of routed, there's routed casualties and there are fatal casualties. Routed casualties means that after this fight, whoever wins or loses, the routed casualties will rejoin their respective army. Fatal casualty, gone forever. So that's, that's going to come back here in a little bit when we talk about aftermath. And then we also get our commander advantage, their commander advantage, and then this weird little uh, 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 zero and over here a zero. This is your combat role. And the game doesn't really do a good job of explaining this, but your combat role is a zero to ten roll. Minimum roll zero, max roll ten. Um, and it will happen every three days once the battle actually starts. You have your progress bar. Now this progress bar is important because it's relative to the terrain that we're on. So our terrain tells us for the military effects, movement speed is reduced by 50%, the combat width is 50%, and defenders get advantage of 12. Let's just click over here real quick. So this is a forest. Combat width is 90, movement speed is 80, and defenders get an advantage of three. So you'll see this happen a lot. The AI will notice, hey, I've got a pretty not so great army. Let me move into the mountains and try and get a better advantage here. So when I hover over this again, take a look at combat width, 681, meaning that that is the very front of your army. So 681 soldiers across on both sides. And this shows us that base 1363, half of the total of all soldiers at the start of the battle, mountains 50%. That's why it's like that. So they, we might outnumber them, by more than two to one, but only 681 of my troops and 681 of their troops are going to be fighting face to face right now. So this is a really good way to take maybe a smaller, more elite army to get a better advantage against your opponent, especially if you have a better commander, you've got stronger knights, whatever the situation is. So we're going to let this progress. I've unpaused it, but we're going to start to get some rolls going on here, and I'll take a look at this number in a second here. So now we're in the early battle phase. That little thing has progressed forward. Now the early battle phase is important because you cannot retreat in this stage even if it's going poorly. But also, if your army is defeated or you defeat the enemy army at this stage, they're completely wiped out. They don't get to re, uh, uh, I guess, reorganize their, casual, their uh, routed troops. Now we've rolled an 8. It's kind of hard to look. There's, we've, we've rolled an 8, they've rolled a 10. Now we can compare this to this center thing right here. Now this gives us a total of 10 advantage in your favor. That advantage, multiply it by 2, and that's the percentage damage bonus for either you, right now it's your damage is increased by 20%, or the enemy, depending on whatever color this number is and whether it says plus or minus. So if it said minus 10, the enemy would get a damage increase of 20%. But we can see from here exactly what's giving us this advantage. Our martial skill, our battle roll of 8, our 5 from leading on soldiers, 5 from Never Back Down, which is a great movie, 5 from Chivalry Focus, but this is against their 35, which is just 12 initially from being defending in mountains, commander's martial skill, battle roll, and leading on soldiers. So, you can see how every 3 days these rolls are going to occur again, and every time they, they result, oh! Our knight, Henry, was wound, or he, he wounded Gerard, and that's going to keep progressing throughout this fight. You're going to wound, maim, or kill a knight, or they're going to do it to you. And there's also a chance that a knight can get maimed, wounded, or killed by just the enemy soldiers. So we're doing some maiming here, which is good, and we'll pause right here real quick. We've now progressed to the late battle phase. So, this army can retreat if it so wishes, and by taking a look at our, our units, we're at 1691 to their 195. We're still relegated to only 681 units fighting each other, but this, this right here tells us how many enemy ca routed casualties there are versus how many routed casualties we have. And that's going to become pretty important here as we move into the aftermath. Ooh, Dito was wounded. See, just by an enemy soldier, not even by a specific knight. 
And as this pushes down to zero, it's going to move into the aftermath. Okay. Oh, a little bit further, it looks like. There it goes. There's your aftermath right there. Aftermath phase. So what happens here is we pursue, they retreat. And pursuing is based off of the total pursuit effect of all of your regiments that have pursuit. I can say pursuit like 50, 50 more times if I so wish. <laughs> but pursuit basically means that you're going to try and kill off these routed casualties. And then the enemy is going to screen them using their regiments and their total screen value. Screen effect per full regiment is 16. So they just get 16 versus my pursuit, which is 10. So they have a positive pursuit or a positive screen of six, meaning that they are going to be able to get more of their routed casualties out of the fight while I will be not be able to get as many as I had so wished. So as this progresses, we'll push that forward a little bit. And that's what happens. I go, I go ahead and, and chop some stuff up. I get a nephew and we can move forward here to Capua itself. And my wife's pregnant. How cool is that? So from here, you want to pretty much push on towards your actual war target. And you want to siege it right about as soon as we get there. We're going to go over war targets and we're going to discuss how that plays into everything. And there we go. So we'll pause right here and we're going to discuss some stuff. So for one, here is, by clicking this little flag, we see all of our uh, war target information. As soon as you hit 30% war score, you can issue a white piece, which pretty much just ends the fighting. You can enforce demands, though, as you progress upwards, and they allow you to accept it. But as you get more important prisoners, say the heir, uh, a really important counselor, or the guy actually defending or attacking himself, the leader of that faction, then this will substantially increase. An heir is worth 50%, um, a specific worthy target. Oh, we've actually captured an heir, or the heir, and... Doesn't look like he's the primary heir. So we've just captured an heir. So that gave us 10%. The primary heir should give us 50. And if we capture him himself, it'll automatically go to 100. But right here, the war score for occupied holdings is the target. And if we get that, if we capture a target, even if you're kind of outnumbered in a fight, that'll almost always push you to the completion zone as fast as possible. So you definitely want to do that. So let's click over here to the fort and we can see some other stats for the siege itself. Our army versus their garrison, 1895 to 347. We're about to be reinforced by this guy who's got some, uh, some mangonels who are gonna really help us out. We can see this is gonna take seven months at the current progress rate. And that progress is gonna change now in 20 days because they've got fully stocked garrison, their health is all normal, and there's no breach in the walls. As this progresses, from uh, fully stocked to not so fully stocked to completely empty to normal to waning to diseased. This will affect the siege progress. So we're going to go ahead and let this kind of, we're going to put this on three speed. And this guy should join us and it'll help us out a bit. So he brought siege weapons. And right now you can see it's at max four months. Because the siege weapons are actually attacking, it's going to, he's, yeah, he's going to be kind of weird and buggy about this trying to attack the, uh, the actual army, but those siege weapons <clears throat> will allow us to put a hole in the wall. And once that happens, we can actually assault the fort. And by assaulting the fort, we will be able to progress this siege much faster. So I'm gonna let this keep going. And hopefully we'll, he'll actually stay with us to do the siege here. You're just kind of bouncing around. Okay, perfect. That's what I wanted to show. So this little ladder right here shows us that it is now time that the walls are being actually assaulted. So siege event, breach, walls, small breach. And that has now reduced from seven months down to three months, and the siege progress has increased. So siege progress will increase depending upon the garrison supplies, the health, if you have siege weapons that are breaking holes in the wall. So you really want to look to that to push this all the way to completion. You can watch that that thing went from seven months to like nothing in no time. And there we go. We have taken their actual uh, war target, the actual Duchy of Capua. We can press this button, enforce our demands, and we have got ourselves 
the lovely Duchy of Capua. So hopefully this gives you a really good frame of reference on how to do combat, especially that portion of really dissecting each and every one of those numbers in the combat field. I feel like the tutorial just really doesn't go over that enough and really doesn't give you a good perspective on how combat really works. And you should really now see how strong individual terrain pieces are. Planes, really great to fight on, right? 100%, well, 80% in combat with and hills. So make sure wherever you're moving your forces, you're not jumping into a situation where you won't be able to bring a superior army to bear. Or if you have a weaker army, or at least a numerically smaller army, then you're using mountains or hills or forests to your advantage, especially if you have things like archers, which gets bonuses in forests. So really take some time, look at the military tab, create some men at arms that make me fit your army and the terrain you'll be fighting in the most to really, really drive home your conquests in Crusader Kings 3. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. If you have any questions, you need me to help clear up any confusion you might have, go ahead and leave a comment below. I will do what I can. I can't promise I'll know all the answers, but I'll give you as best I can. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Have a good one and take care.